Hey guys, it's your girl Sean Etienne, and I wanted to talk to you guys today about the wealth gap that a lot of research has been reporting that it is growing between blacks and whites in America. And I know we are all aware that unemployment rates remain the highest among us black people here in America, and the wealth gap just tends to keep growing and growing and growing. But you know, Oftentimes, we don't hear about the wealthy people that do exist in America, the wealthy black people that do exist in America. We always really just think about wealth and we associate it almost automatically with white people. But I was going over some research studies and I found them very interesting, nonetheless. And so I want to show you guys a video that I found. That I find this video to be quite comical. Not because it really is funny, because it's not, but because I find humor in a lot of things. But I'm going to share this video with you guys, and then we're going to have a conversation about wealth and money and what we need to start doing differently. Because yes, the wealth gap in, in Black America is extremely wide when we relate it to white America. But I want to have in our heads an image that Black wealthy people who are not necessarily his celebrities do exist in America but we don't see them often and we don't hear about them often, but it's important for us to really examine who they are and what they are doing because there's always jewels that folks leave behind. People who are successful, there's always tips and jewels and nuggets that are left behind. And sometimes we just have to be willing to listen to them and follow route. We need to follow suit to pick up what they are doing and make a difference. So let me go ahead and share this video with you guys, and we're going to discuss what we just, what I'm about to show you guys. This is Black America, and this is Black America. I'm very aware and conscious of my color in society. Bertram Lee is a freshman at Haverford College in Haverford, Pennsylvania. Tuition is $38,000 a year. The school boasts four Nobel laureates, and students play croquet on manicured lawns. Uh, croquet on manicured lawns. I mean, I, it's cute. I guess if that's their culture, it's really, really cute. In a student body of nearly 1,200, there are 98 Blacks. Even in this idyllic setting, Lee feels the tensions of race in America. Sometimes you wear fitted hats, you don't wear it straight like a baseball cap. Or they're like, don't be offended. But, you know, are, are you a thug or a gangster or something? I'm like, what? I look like Carlton Banks. His grandfather was a prominent judge in Baltimore. His late father, a businessman, co-owned the Denver Nuggets. His mother is a top lobbyist on Capitol Hill. Lee says she instilled in him a love for his race. 98 black students on the campus out of 1,200. 98 black students out of 1,200 students in total. That is small. And even though he rightfully can afford to be there, he still experiences racism. So he may be shielded from what many of us have been exposed to, continue to be exposed to, or who are working in the trenches fighting against such injustices. So he doesn't get to see that part. But nonetheless, despite how much money he has, despite his family's background in terms of their affluence and their influence in the community, he still has to deal with racism. A lot of times people will say to me, you know, I think that when you get higher up in level, you don't deal with racism, you deal with classism. So it's not a race thing, it's really like a class thing. But as we can see, listening to this young man talk, that's not the case. He experiences racism and he probably experiences classism as well. So I think that was very important to, um, to really point out because I think sometimes we, we, people who are not at that level of affluence, we tend to think that something is a little bit easier when you get up to that level than it is when you're, when you're poor or you're middle class or you're working class, whatever the case is. It's not the case. Racism exists at all levels and we really have to 
drill that into our heads and into our thinkings. I, I don't I don't want any of us to believe that if you make a little bit of money, you're not going to deal with racism because that's that's a totally false narrative to have. So Black is beautiful, man. Black is beautiful. People don't say that enough. Virtually is black and affluent in America. He says that means he straddles two worlds and two sets of expectations. From blacks he hears, You're rich. You're a rich boy. You don't understand anything about what we go through or what the struggle is. And from whites, You're either an affirmative action case or you're here because you're playing a sport. Dr. Carlotta Miles has known Bertram Lee all his life. She's a renowned psychiatrist in Washington, D.C. Do you think most Americans have no clue that privileged, wealthy, well-connected black people exist in decent sized numbers? We're invisible. Why? Because we don't match the stereotype. The stereotype for black Americans is poverty, failure, victimization, and mediocrity. I understand where she's coming from, but that doesn't say if we are not as affluent as she is, that we all, the rest of us fit that stereotype. And I know that that's not the message she was probably trying to get off, but that didn't ring really nicely on my ears because what you just named about the stereotype, I don't fit that either, but I'm not affluent. I don't, I don't live in a prominent neighborhood with a prominent house and with prominent children that's not my lifestyle so i just feel like the divide between black america is great and we really need to address this divide because if if we if somebody like me doesn't have her status or her wealth does that mean that in her head i also fit that stereotype of black america i'm not sure what she meant by that but I know I watched it like three or four times and, 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 and neither time did it ring comfortable on my ears. So let me go ahead. I'm going to rewind that and I'm going to play for you guys again. And I want you to pay attention to what she's saying is the reason why she and other people like her are invisible here in America because they don't fit the stereotype. And think about the stereotype that he, she's speaking to and see if you fit that stereotype because. I don't fit that stereotype, and I'm clearly not invisible. <laughs> we don't match the stereotype. The stereotype for Black Americans is poverty, failure, victimization, and mediocrity. Poverty, failure, victimization, and mediocrity. Poverty. I don't match that stereotype. Failure, I don't match that stereotype. Victimization, I don't match that stereotype. And mediocrity, there's nothing mediocre about me. But I am not in her class. I want you guys to really think about that for a moment. And, and, and I don't know if you picked up on any of the energy that I picked up on, but I know that this, is, this also speaks to a problem that we have here in Black America, that we have a lot of divides among us, and we have a lot of stereotypes, discrimination amongst us, and intra, intra within the race, intra racism among us as well. So I really want you to pay attention to that, and, and let me go ahead and keep going. These are great. Dr. Miles, a mother of three, emphasizes success in her home with a family hall of fame. The hall is covered with photographs dating back to the 1850s. That's my dad and his colleagues. These are all doctors. And uh, that's Grandpa Henry. Basically made a fortune before the Civil War. This is my beloved, beloved grandmother. These people all had graduate degrees at the time when most people didn't have a college degree. Achievements made despite the racism that existed then and now. This was... Okay, so I like the fact that she went through her wall. 
and she was able to speak to her generations dating back to the 1800s. I think she said 1850 or something like that. But the point is, I really did like that she, she has done that because as a clinician, especially one who specializes in relationships, marriage counseling, couples therapy, which is me, and I do genograms on a lot of people that work with me, it breaks my heart when I do their genograms, how many people are not able to go back generations into their family. And that's important to know where you come from. And I think that that plays a major part on how information is disseminated and how information is passed down from generation to generation. And it also gives people hope. Like she said, everybody, her father and all their colleagues and everyone, her relatives, they all had doctorates degrees or graduate degrees. And that's really, really important. Not because um, education is an end all be all, but, but it sets a precedent and it, it helps to position people in a better, a better position to be able to fight against poverty, right? It's, discrimination is always going to be there. Racism is always going to be there. There's going to be things that's always going to be there for all of us to face, but we have to have the correct tools and resources to fight against it. And many people in her family were doctors, and many people have acquired wealth during a time where it was really hard for Blacks to get ahead in America nonetheless. So she got to where she's at, not because she's a hard worker by herself, but because of generational wealth. So that was a nugget that I took and I noted for my, my thinking to discuss with you guys is that generational wealth is extremely important so that our children and their children and their children's children will be, will, will be able to experience um, some of what we're seeing right here in this video. 23rd year. 23 years ago, Dr. Miles created the Tuxedo Ball. Actually, this tell me. so nice to see you again. <laughs> A place for privileged black children to mingle and make professional connections. Bertram Lee believes it will help his future political career. You could find yourself a job, an internship, opportunity, advice. You're talking to people who generally are amazing at what they do. They're successful. It's so hard to find that, especially like being out in the world. You have to be black and you have to be wealthy. You don't have to be wealthy. You just have to be a part of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! She said, you don't have to be wealthy. You just have to be a part of the group. That was hilarious. But listen, guys, I can't be mad at her. I can't be mad at them. What they do is they put together these tuxedo balls for their children and is a way for them to network and is a way for them to pretty, in my opinion, to model and mimic what they have seen their parents and their friends and family done as a part of this elite network. And it's also probably a place for them to, to date within their their culture, their money circle, right? It's, it's, that's important. And we really do have to understand the science of mating and how we choose who we have children with and how we choose who we marry because this goes into your legacy. And oftentimes, too many of us, we don't think legacy. We think today, right now, maybe next year or five years from now, but we don't think legacy. These people are not thinking about today, tomorrow, or next week. What they're actually thinking about is 25 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, two generations from now. That's how they're thinking. So when they're strategically planning these things like the tuxedo ball, it's for the purpose of continuing their legacy. That's really what it's about. So when I, when I um, heard this part and she was like, you don't have to be wealthy. And then she caught herself and she was like, you just have to belong. <laughs> I just found that division right there. I just found that intra, intra, not inter, not from race to race, but I just found that intra racism right there. It was like a, um, a, a separation. It was like, oh no, well, well, you just got to be a part of this group. <laughs> and if you're not part of this group, this, you just can't come to the ball. That's, that's just it. <laughs>
It's for us. And, and, and hey, if that's what you do, that's what you do. We don't want to go to your ball. We can create our own ball. But the point is, they're very strategic, very strategic on how they continue the legacies of their wealth. And that is something to pay attention to. It's not the end or be all, but it's definitely something to pay attention to. Affairs like these exclude many, says Darren Walker, a vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation. He spent his career studying race. Many people in the African-American community react angrily because one part of our community seems quite comfortable adopting the exclusive practices of the majority community that for many years kept us out. I don't think the tuxedo wall should be vilified. It's doing something for the privileged children who people think don't need anything. What they see is exclusion. What they see is elitism. Most of us are tremendously active doing things for needy children. Your sister was quite uncomfortable there. She says she don't think that the tuxedo ball should be vilified. She doesn't see the exclusion. She doesn't see the separation. She doesn't see the intra-racism. She doesn't see it. And she thinks that, you know, is doing something for the privileged children. Well, what's the difference between her thoughts and the thoughts of wealthy white people that are very exclusionary and they feel like, you know, you don't gotta be white, you just gotta be a part of this group. However, everybody in the group is white as well. That afternoon before the gala, there are several black cultures, a day of seminars. I don't believe in myself. How can I convince you to be my girlfriend? How can I convince you to give me a job? Get your report together. Leadership comes from. In a seminar called Pathways to Leadership, Bertrand Lee spoke about his elite New England high school. We had many issues with uh, diversity. Um, one of my teachers in my class actually called me a nigger in class. He said, Mom, there was an incident. One of the teachers used the N-word in the classroom. Lee's mother, Laura Murphy, was hurt. The sense of anguish you feel when your child has that hurt sound in his voice and I was really pleased when he told me that he was going to organize a forum at the headmaster's house. What's the lesson in that? Do something. Do you let it in? Do you let them tell you who you are? No. What y'all think about that? What did y'all think about that? You know, he's he was called the n-word in his high school and he organized this this committee to fight back against the injustices and i think that's pretty awesome that he did such a thing so i just i like to hear these different stories and at the same time i like to critically analyze them because it's making it seem like we can take this message and give this message to anybody black in america and they should be able to do something with it but we know that that's not the case because class, class, different class statuses play a very important role here in America. And we just know, you know, race alone, people are not treated equally. But when you put race and class in it, come on. Many of our children are not going to be able to relate to these children whatsoever. But I wanted to get you guys' thoughts about that. What do you think about that? That evening, the big event. <laughs> It's a magical night with historic precedents. From W.E.V. Du Bois at the 1910 Midwinter Assembly to Carlotta Buffy Gordon, now known as Dr. Miles. Affluent blacks have been passing on the legacy of success for well over a hundred years. What the tuxedo ball reminds me personally is that you cannot settle for mediocrity. We mobilize our kids to go out and make a difference. My idea of blackness may not be what society says or what other people say blackness is. I can't help that I was born in the place that I was born in. I can only hope to make the world a better place from that. I mean, I have a lot of 
issues that I've taken up with that because it's not as cut and dry and you know you telling them to go and do something about it and there's a big disconnection with their world and the world of majority of the black people in America and I like when a young man says um when he goes to the tuxedo ball it just is a constant reminder that you just can't be mediocre but you know there's also a reason why they are at the level that they are in. And again, that's going to go to what I'm about to end this video with. They're at the level that they are in because of generational wealth. And it's so important that we consider that and we factor that into the equation because it's not that easy. But we're not all for victim victimization. We're not victims here. We just need to learn what other people are doing so we can implement it as well. And we may not see that level of wealth in our lifetime, and we have to be okay with that. But if we start to position our children and our children's children for that lifestyle and for that level of success, it, it is possible. It's possible. We just have to be consistent, and we have to financially discipline ourselves in order to get there. So here's what I'm going to say to you guys, because... I can go on and on and on about the statistics regarding the wealth gap. So what are some of the reasons why this is the case? It's easy for us to blame it on single parent household. It's easy for us to blame it on geographic segregation or low levels of education attainment, not going to college or not having enough college, whatever the case is. It's easy for us to blame it on that. But I think that that is, that'll be way too simple. Um, we have to give a lot of credence to generational wealth. And we have to really study what people have done and continue to do that keeps them at the top of the food chain when it becomes when it comes down to, to money and wealth. And when I'm talking about wealth, I'm not talking about your income. I'm not talking about the amount of money that's actually sitting in your bank account. When I'm speaking of wealth, I'm talking about your assets, your assets minus your liabilities. These people have properties over properties. They have corporations and businesses. They have things that if, you know, if liquidated, that's where their wealth comes in at. They have things that they pass down from one generation to another generation. That's what makes a generational wealth. Not that they make six figures a year and they're like, okay, I'm wealthy. That's not wealth. But that they own real estate property, that they own businesses and corporations, that they own stocks and investments, that they have college saving plans for their children so that they can prepare their children to go on to college and not only go on to college, but that their children come out of college without college debt. So those things are highly, highly important for us to really, really look at. So here's what I'm going to say to you guys, that we need to be taught how to invest. There are a lot of classes out there, online classes, in-person classes that teach about investments, investments in the stock market, the investments in different um, savings plans. We have to get ourselves into the habits of investing. Okay. I always tell people to keep your debt balances low. That's credit card debt. That's car loan debt. That is mortgage debt. That is college debt, especially college debt, because people are going on to college and they're coming out with so much debt that they can't get themselves out of the hole. They're paying off college for the rest of their lives. And if you can send your children to college and have them come out without having college debt, you have placed your children in a better position to succeed. Of course, you have to teach them the other things like investments and stocks and savings and stuff like that. But if they come out, Without college debt, they are right on track. They are right where we need them to be, okay? You also want to start paying attention to real estate. You really need to start paying attention to rental properties and, and commercial properties and stuff of that nature because that's where the money accumulates over time. And that's what you can pass down to your children. You know, it, it's better to pass your children down five houses as opposed to just passing your children down one house. So if you pass them down five houses and they're all rental properties, they don't have to live in them. They just acquire that, that property and take on its income that it brings in. That's highly important. And then they'll be able to leverage themselves off of those properties because of the equity to buy other properties and to multiply that, um, get equity, send their children to college so their children don't have to have college debt get equity so that they can not only improve their houses, but they can invest in stocks and bonds and all that other kind of stuff. 
So here's some simple solutions other than what I just told you guys that you can implement right now and you don't have to worry about having a lot of money to do it. First, start making some stock investments. If you are not familiar with the stock market and you're not comfortable making major investments right now, start off with a stash account. And that's very simple to do. Get a stash account, get a stash app, and start to invest your money in that. Just get into the habit of doing it. Even if you only invest $5 a week, just get into the habit of doing it till you get comfortable not even thinking about that money, not even worrying about that money not being in your checking account. Start to invest it into some stocks, okay, so that you can grow that revenue. It's not going to happen overnight, but if, you're st if you start doing this by the time your children become adults and they have children, you have something to pass down to them because generational wealth is not about you and where you are at right now but instead what generational wealth is about is about the generations that's going to come after you so you have to start thinking legacy not today not tomorrow next week or next year but legacy what am i leaving behind okay that's going to help my children and my grandchildren um your pension plans Start investing into your pension plans. If you do not have a self-directed IRA, I suggest that you also look into having a self-directed IRA because, I mean, I'm not a financial advisor, so you're going to have to speak to your financial advisor, but you can direct that money into real estate to start to invest in real estate to grow that money in your IRA plan. So those are really important strategies related to our children in higher education is get them a 529 plan. That is a college savings plan plan and if you have more than one child let's say for example your child your first child goes to college your first child is brilliant and gets a whole bunch of financial aid and scholarships or whatever the case is you don't have to cash out that 529 plan if you have another if you have a, a, a second child you could just roll it over into that child's name and keep the money accumulated and that's what i've done for my children so you have to really start considering these things whatever you do just don't sit back and do nothing. We just have to be disciplined and we have to be okay with knowing that it's not going to um, benefit us and our generation, but it's not about us. It's about a legacy. So we have to really start leaving the legacy for our children and our children's children. You guys have a blessed day and let me know what your thoughts are with respect to this podcast. Love you all and take care.